The journey began at the McLaren Technology Centre in Woking a couple of days ago. We went there to go and pick up the MP412C and have a look around, sort of, well, for me to go, I've never been there before, go and see all the history of all the cars. It's an amazing place. It's kind of, they say it's like 90% NASA and 10% Disney. The Woking plant is immaculately clean. Like someone's wanted to preserve that just unwrapped on Christmas morning feeling. It is quite literally factory fresh. My favourite factoid is that apparently while Ron Dennis was having his Sunday lunch, he decided that the new production centre where the MP412C is now built needed to be 99 metres wide rather than the previously planned 100. The reason? Well, it seems that between a Yorkshire pudding and a Brussels sprout, Ron had worked out that the small reduction in width would leave the floor tiles fitting flush against the wall. No messy half tiles for McLaren. You've got to admire that sort of fastidiousness, even if it probably doesn't make for the most riveting conversation at mealtimes. The plan, once we'd got our hands on the car and driven responsibly slowly away from the factory, was simple, to drive and keep driving for the next few days. Obviously, with Britain covered in a grey blanket of torrential summer rain, the first task was to make a beeline for the Euroton and head the 30 or so miles to sunny France, where the rain turned out to be even worse. This is absurd. monsoon. It did eventually clear up, and with time on our side, the idea was to avoid the auto routes. There was just one hitch. While the McLaren's media system works really well, that's not my music by the way, there's still no inbuilt sat-nav system, and the one we'd brought with us had all the directional sense of a drunk stumbling out of a pub. The end result of all this was that we got a bit lost on the first evening. And once we got a bit lost, we then got really lost. We did eventually find somewhere to sleep, and the following morning we headed down to the old circuit at Reims. On duller stretches of road, McLaren is amazingly happy mooching. Leave it in auto and it's actually quite easy to forget you're in a supercar, which admittedly could be construed as both a good and a bad thing. It is undeniably relaxing though. There's an almost waterbed feeling as the car floats over the surface and soaks up big bumps. It's such an atmospheric place. Those stands, you can still imagine the cars hammering down. One of the nice bits of history about Reims is the fact that in 1966, they, the French Grand Prix had been held there every year for the previous five years, and then it was going to be moved that year. The teams got together and decided to hold a sort of non-championship race there, which Bruce McLaren won. It's nice taking McLaren back there. After some pensive, wistful reflection and longing looks, it was time to get a bit of a wriggle and actually make some progress. full-on, widescreen view out of the McLaren, thankfully made it a doddle to guide through small towns and down pothole back streets of villages, where it looked about as alien as the Mars rover amongst all the rustic buildings. It still wasn't as cool as this Peugeot 505 dangle though. One of the changes they've made to the MP4-12C since the launch is that there's now more sound inside the cabin when you put it in sport mode. 
That's still no excuse for not putting the window down through the tunnels. Eventually we reached the foothills of the Alps and the beautiful stretch of alpine-fed water that is Lake Annecy. Sleeping always seems vastly overrated when you've got a supercar at your disposal. So after only a few hours kip, we got up and headed south with a plan. It's all well and good doing the sort of the mundane stuff through the rest of France, but at the end of the day, it's not, it's not a diesel Golf, it's a supercar. And it's all about the driving, so we had to come to the best place in the world to drive a supercar, which is here. slightly further north rather than taking route Napoleon through Dean Le Bain and Castellan and we come through Bassenel Net on the D900 and then we took a punt rather because it said this coal was closed down on the main road. This is the Col de la Bonnet and this is the very first day that it's open this year and it is absolutely incredible. critical of on the pre-production demand for the carbon brakes that they both came with. This has got steel brakes and I have to say they are a lot better. Just occasionally they still throw on the odd inconsistency. Slightly too sharp when you first get on the pedal but basically they're an awful lot better and you certainly want good brakes up here. Oh, listen to the sound of it. It might not be a Ferrari, but it still makes an absolutely incredible noise. This has to be one of the best days of my life ever. It's almost like a new breed of supercar, the way the R8 raised the game. It's so clean and it's all... You almost think that it's, it could be forgiven for being almost sort of unemotional or boring because it's so clean, it's not moving around really. But it's almost like a four-wheel drive car when you, you really get it moving. It helps you into corners, you can feel it adjusting the angle and it just gives you so much confidence. It makes you actually raise your game because you're just going, you're going faster, it feels like, than, well, any other car I can think of. My favorite thing has to be, though, just the driving position. They've got it so right. You need it on roads like this because this is actually quite narrow. And you're literally you're pitching front wheel from apex to apex, and there's basically a lot of fresh air the other side of each one. And sitting in this front position, it feels like you're absolutely on the nose of the car. You can place it where you want. When I said before, in town, it was easy to maneuver. Well, imagine that tenfold up here. It's just... <laughs> I just love it. <laughs> We're nearly 3,000 metres up here. This is the highest coal in Europe. So turbocharging, a bit of forced induction is actually a very, very good thing. At times, when you first drive, you think there's not a lot of feel through the steering. But, to be honest, it's almost because you're probably not driving it hard enough at that point. Now you can feel the wheels moving around, you can feel the slip at the front, a bit of slip at the rear. It's so 
involving. You shouldn't be able to drive a supercar this fast on this road. It's too narrow. It's, it's too dangerous, but it's not. This car gives you so much confidence. There was only ever one place we were going to end up. Not only has Monaco seen some amazing moments from McLaren's F1 team over the years, it must play host to more supercars than any other patch of tarmac in the world. This is where the MP412C needs to feel at home, amongst all the mahogany tans and the champagne soaked super yachts. The difference with our car was that the glitzy volcano orange paintwork was covered in dust and streaked with road grime from the past three days on the move. To be honest, that's how I think it should be. It looks cool that way. It's indicative of the fact that, as long as you've got a decent map, the MP412C is a supercar for long journeys. A supercar to be used. <laughs>